Nigel Marsh. He spent 25 years in the marketing industry. And in 2010, he gave a talk at a TEDx event in Sydney, Australia. And that talk was entitled, How to Make Work-Life Balance Work. And during that talk, Nigel said this. He said, if you don't design your life, someone else will design it for you. And you may not like their idea of balance. Work-life balance, right? It's an idea and a term that's familiar to many of us. And at its core, it's a term that points people towards finding the proper balance between pursuing daily achievement and daily enjoyment. And we're all seeking that balance because we all want to achieve and we all want to enjoy. The term work-life balance, right, it's so ubiquitous today that I think we believe this might have always been around, and yet it was used for the very first time in the United Kingdom in the 1970s. And the first time it was used in the United States was in 1986. Now, I love charts and graphs. It's kind of like a love language for me. So much so that Allison Smith, our adult life director, sent me an email this week with the subject line, data, just to get me to read it faster. And it worked. I like saw it and opened it right away. Now why do I tell you this? Because I'm showing you a chart. So this is a chart that shows all the times from, the 18, from 1800 all the way through to 2010 that this phrase, work-life balance, showed up in published materials. Where the line starts to tick upwards, that's 1996. That's just 20 years ago. And since then, you can see that this term has been used exponentially more in published literature all around the world. Culturally, this idea of work-life balance is a modern phenomenon. But it's actually an ancient truth that our modern culture has only recently discovered. So we're in the third and final week of our series, Soul Rest, and we're bringing the series to a close by talking about work and rest. And for many of us, when we hear these two words, work and rest, they sound like diametrically opposed words, words that don't fit together in the same sentence. They're kind of like oil and water. They can coexist inside of the same container, but they're not words or ideas that are going to mix well. Many of us have read articles or blog posts or books that talk about finding a healthy work-life balance. Many of us go to work in environments where our human resources departments talk abstractly about needing to seek and find a healthy work-life balance. And that's no matter where we work. Whether we're a college student who's studying, whether we're a parent at home, whether we're in the service industry or the corporate world or in healthcare, we discover these cultures that are directly opposed to finding a healthy balance of our personal life and our work life. Now, I spent nearly six years at Alcoa. It's a, at the time, it was a Fortune 100 company with operating locations and employees all around the world. And in my time there, I really discovered that there was this almost implicit code of conduct. None of my managers ever said this directly to me, but it was still implicit in the culture, and it was this. Do whatever you need to do to help the company's bottom line, even if that means working incredibly long hours, traveling 75 to 90% of the year, and prioritizing the company over every other aspect of your life. And if you do this, you'll be financially rewarded. I had coworkers who were making well into the six figures whose families were living in different states because several moves back, the family and the children had just decided that it, it wasn't wise or healthy to keep moving the family every two to three years when no one was getting to see mom or dad consistently anyways. Hardly an example of a healthy work-life balance. Maybe tonight maybe tomorrow, but every one of us is going to go to work in environments where we're implicitly promised that if we commit ourselves wholly and completely to our work, we will be greatly rewarded. 
And most of us, if not all of us, have an exceptionally difficult time resting well. We're incredibly busy. We're pressured. We're stressed. And sometimes, no matter how hard we try, we can't leave work at work. And the stress and the pressure, they follow us home and they impact our relationships with our friends and our family, our, our spouses and our children. What are we to do? We need to work and we need to rest. But we're so much better at working than resting. We're so much better at achieving our goals than finding rest for our souls. Now, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, when I say soul, this is what I mean. And this is the definition that we've been using for the past two weeks in this series. It's this, you are a soul. You have a body. The soul is the real you that will last forever. Your soul is the part of you that will outlast your body. Your soul is who you are now and for the rest of eternity. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's the very first book in the New Testament, and it's the very first of the four Gospels that begin the New Testament. And in each of these Gospels, we get stories of Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, and resurrection. And in the 11th chapter in the Gospel of Matthew, we hear Jesus speak these words, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus invites every woman and man who labors, who works, to come to him and find rest for their weary and burdened souls. Can we do that? Can we come to Jesus and find rest for our weary and burdened souls? just as he promised. Now let's start attempting to answer that question by first discussing why we work. A little over two years ago, Wired Magazine published this short online article. And in that article, they tried to answer the question, why do we work and learn? And this is the answer that they proposed. It said, maybe the real reason is that we do these things, work and learn, not because of grades and money, but because that's just what humans do. Work and learn. That's just what humans do. That's a pep talk that'll get you out of bed in the morning. The author of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, provides a very different perspective on why we work. And in short, it's this. We work because God works. The book of Genesis plays out this rhythm where God works for six straight days, separating the light from the dark, creating the sky and the heavens, creating land and vegetation, creating sun, moon, and stars, filling the oceans with fish and filling the air with birds. And then on the sixth day, his capstone creation, he creates man and woman. This is what we read in Genesis 1, starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What we take from the entirety of the first chapter in the very first book in the Bible is this, God worked and God created man and woman in his own image. What we as Christians believe is that every person ever created is created in God's image, whether they recognize it or believe it. That every person resembles and reflects God. My three children, Keely, Jay, and Joel, they are made in God's image. And each one of them reflects and resembles God. Quick aside, this is my son, Jay. Just look at that guy. This week, he started preschool. And on his very first day of preschool, my wife, Julia, took him, dropped him off. And at the end of the day, she went and she picked him up. And when he got into the van, she asked him, Jay, how was your day? His answer was... 
I saved a girl. I saved the girl in the flower dress. Which is a really interesting statement. So Julia, intrigued, said, well, Jay, how did you do that? And he replied, she couldn't get her straw into her juice box, so I did it for her because I am very strong. <laughs> and then, like, the best part is that after a dramatic pause, he looked at Julia with this, like, really pleased look on his face, and he said, I saved her life. After the 11 o'clock service, somebody came up to me in the lobby and asked me, that story about your son, what did it have to do with the sermon? Nothing. I'm just sharing a story I love about my son. So back to the sermon. Genesis 1 tells us that God works and that every person is created in God's image. And when we turn to the second chapter of Genesis, we read this. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. So God is done with all of his creating work. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. The first chapter in Genesis shows God working. And the second chapter in Genesis shows God resting. And we are made in the image of God. Maybe you see where this is headed. The author of Genesis, then in the middle part of chapter 2, he describes the Garden of Eden and then turns to the first humans, Adam and Eve, and he addresses them. And right about in the middle of that chapter, chapter 2, we're told this, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to keep it, I'm sorry, to work it and keep it. So Adam's first job was given to him directly by God. And he was to tend the garden, to keep the garden, to work the garden, to cultivate the Garden of Eden. My first job was a Burger King. I was 14 years old. I worked Saturday mornings from 4.30 in the morning until 1 p.m. I lasted four months. I still remember the conversation when my manager fired me. He told me that I talked too much and that he knew I made too many French toast sticks on purpose and that I was eating the extras. <laughs> and he was right. I made $4.25 an hour, minimum wage, in 1994. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about Adam's work because I did that the last Sunday in June in a different sermon that was creatively titled Work. You can find that sermon on YouTube if you're interested. But here's what we need to know. Adam and Eve's work given to them by God was to tend and cultivate the garden. They were to take all the raw materials of creation and to reshape them and reform them in a way that would help the garden and their children to thrive and flourish. This is work as it was intended, a divine gift from God to his capstone creation. And it was work that directly reflected God's own work in whose image they were made. But we don't really experience work in the same way, do we? The work that many of us do, it doesn't really feel like reshaping and reforming so that the earth and the people in it can thrive and flourish. It oftentimes feels like meaningless toil, like we're running as fast as we can on a wheel going nowhere and accomplishing nothing. Why? Why don't we experience work the way that Adam and Eve did? Well, the author of Genesis tells us in the third chapter of the book that something went horribly wrong. Adam and Eve, in direct disobedience to God, eat a piece of fruit from a forbidden tree. It's what we as Christians refer to as the fall. Through that one act of rebellion, sin and death and shame enter the world, and work is cursed. So let's just listen to God as he pronounces the consequences, the curse of Adam's sin. He says this in Genesis 3, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Pastor and author, John Mark Comer, he writes this, fatigue, burnout, back pain, ibuprofen, strife, 
litigation, greed, waste, poverty, injustice, wishing you had more vacation time, all this comes in the way of Adam's first bite. So here's the short form of the narrative arc presented in the first three chapters of Genesis. God works, God rests, man and woman, a result of God's work, are created in his image, man and woman are given the divine gift of work, the fall occurs, and work is cursed. Now there's a story a little bit later in Genesis that illustrates what work becomes after the fall, and it's the story of the Tower of Babel. It's where a large group of people gather together and decide that they're going to build a tower that will reach from the earth all the way into the heavens. Their reason for doing this is in Genesis 11. Let us make a name for ourselves. Work is no longer about reshaping and reforming so that the earth and the people in it can thrive and flourish. Work is now primarily about making a name for ourselves. And it really hasn't changed all that much since Genesis. We strive to achieve more and more at work. We work more and more hours so that we can get the project done or the paper turned in on time. And to what end? What's it for? To make a name for ourselves. We're so addicted to making a name for ourselves, otherwise known as being successful, that we make it a god instead of God. And we seek to find our identity and security and value and worth through our achievements and accomplishments, GPAs, offices, titles, paychecks, cars, clothes, and houses. But what do we risk losing in the process? Now, I've said this in some different sermons before, but my job at Alcoa was managing and supporting a software application. It was used by thousands of people all over the world. And the number of emails, phone calls, instant messages that I would get in the course of the day were absolutely overwhelming. I'd go away for a week on vacation, and it would take me about six months to dig back out from underneath this pile of communication that I had missed in that one week. But my problem wasn't all the work. My problem was that I was a guy with two undergraduate degrees, one in English and one in education. And I was working in a department filled with people who had MBAs from Carnegie Mellon. And every day I was going to work trying to prove that I belonged in the company. So I did the sensible thing. I worked all the time. I would get to work every morning at 7 a.m. I'd usually leave around 6 o'clock. Alcoa's um, headquarters are located right in the north side. and That's where I lived. So at 6 o'clock, I'd walk home. When I'd get home, I'd have dinner, and then I would turn my computer back on, and I would work until I would go to bed. I would literally get phone calls in the middle of the night about servers crashing in different parts of the world, And I would wake up, make a pot of coffee, work until the issue was resolved, and then rather than go back to bed, I'd just start my work day at 3 or 4 in the morning. And the upside to all of this was that implicit code of conduct actually worked in my favor, and I was promoted, and I got paid really well. The downside was that I started to lose my identity in the job. This really hit home for me when I was on a trip in California, And one of the people who used our software kept clicking on a button and they just kept getting an error message, which clearly was an issue with our software. And in a moment of frustration, this person said, this thing is like so dumb and stupid. And somehow I thought they had said that to me, that I was dumb and stupid. And so I responded angrily about how I wasn't actually dumb or stupid. And that kind of tipped me over to this point that I was starting to lose myself to this job. In the words of Nigel Marsh, I'd allowed my company to design my life. And for what? Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark, that's the second book in the New Testament, he asks this question to a group of people. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? While I may have been gaining the world in many different senses, I was also forfeiting my soul. How is it that many people that we know, maybe even some of us, 
get tricked into thinking that it's more important to gain the world than it is to find rest for our souls. So we've seen God work and rest. But so far in what we've worked through, we've only seen man and woman work. And that got cursed. Rest for Adam and Eve appears in the second book of the Old Testament, Exodus. And it's embodied by what God calls Sabbath. The Hebrew word that's translated as Sabbath, it literally means rest, stop, cease. And we discover that Sabbath or rest is a rhythm that God is so serious about, not only for himself, but for all women and men, that he actually legislated that his people keep the Sabbath day holy, just as God himself had. It's in Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The author of Exodus tells God's people to remember the Sabbath day. And later in the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Old Testament, God's people are told to observe the Sabbath day. Both of these words, remember and observe, are verbs. They're action words. They require intentional activity on the part of God's people. Now, both Pastor Kent in week one of this series and Pastor Scott last week, they spoke something along these lines. They'd said, Sabbath requires work, which seems like a really strange thing to say when I've just been talking about how Sabbath means resting, stopping, and ceasing. But this is what they both meant. Sabbath requires intentional planning and preparing. We can't unintentionally stumble into the Sabbath. We need to get ready, run errands, make arrangements, and truly commit to resting. When we rest, we can sleep in. We can relax. We can wake up at 8 a.m., make a cup of good coffee, and sit down with our Bible and journal and pray. We can eat good food that we purchased the day before because we planned ahead and ran that errand in preparation for resting. We can go for a walk or a run or a bike ride. We can sit in a park. We can watch a movie. We can spend time laughing and playing and enjoying our friends. We don't buy or sell, unless we're hitting up a really good brunch spot. Where's a really good brunch spot? I'm so glad you asked. E2 in Highland Park, Point Bruges in Point Breeze, Tartine in the West End, and Meat and Potatoes downtown, just to name a few. If you're new to the area, you now have four great places to start a brunch adventure with. We don't touch our email. We only text to coordinate plans for that day. If at all possible, we put our phones down entirely for the day, and we don't pick them back up until we're setting our alarm for the next morning. We don't run errands or accomplish chores around the house. We don't go to the really nice shops on Walnut Street and think about all the things we want to buy but don't actually need. But maybe you're like Julie and I, and you recognize that you need to rest well but you also recognize that you don't know how to do it that well, and you're trying to figure it out. It's okay. It's a skill that we can all grow in. I think Julie and I are still trying to figure it out. But here's what it looks like for us. Saturdays are our day to rest as a family. So yesterday, that was our day. We spent the morning with Paul Hunter, our new East End campus pastor, and his wife Mandy and their three children, Madison, Luke, and Jacob. We went to Point State Park, and all of our children got up on the fountain, and they ran around the rim, and I was really concerned about our little two-year-old Joel, who was running around just like all of the big kids, because he thinks for some reason that he's big, but he's not. He's really little, and I was getting very anxious about him running around and thinking that he was going to fall into the water and that I was going to have to go in and get him, so I just took him off the ledge, and then he didn't really like that, and he cried, so for a little bit, there wasn't much rest, but still, it was Saturday, and it was good. We had lunch with the hunters. 
And then after lunch, Julia and I put the kids in the car and we drove to a wedding that I was officiating for a girl that I've known since she was 10 years old. She's 26 years old now. And at the wedding, we ate, we laughed, we played, and then we came home and put the kids to bed. But it took work, planning and preparing to get this day. And it's something that Julia does so well for our family. All of the grocery shopping happened on Monday. Errands happened on Wednesday. That's the day that Julia and Mandy planned our family outing. Thursday, she ran more errands and picked up everything that we needed. Friday night, I pulled together everything for the wedding and made sure I was completely prepared for today, Sunday. All of that so that we could simply wake up on Saturday and be together and not have to accomplish or achieve or produce anything. Sometimes for us, resting looks like going to a movie as a family or it's playing Legos with our children for hours. It's a trip to the Splash Park on Troy Hill. It's a late breakfast at Lindo's, an absolute treasure on the north side. It's a walk to the point. It's shaved ice at Gus and Yaya's. It's grilling, snuggling on the couch with Julia after the children go to bed. And we don't always get it right. But invariably, when we commit to it, something supernatural happens. We get our souls back. And we're reminded that we're not machines. But what happens when we don't get it right? And I'll just speak for myself. If I stay up too late on Friday, because I haven't been diligent through the day or the week, I end up waking up on Saturday morning and I am grouchy and I am irritable and I am impatient with our children. I'm distracted because I have stuff that still needs to be done. And as we go through the day, my anxiety level just increases because there's work that needs to be done. And while I love my family, they're not helping me get that work done and I need to get that work done for Sunday. And it's not at all an exaggeration to say that what I just described is an accurate depiction of what I'm actually like when I don't get Sabbath right. But there's something else for us here. Resting requires more from us than just planning and preparing. It requires trust. It requires that we recognize that we don't ultimately provide for ourselves. God does. God is our provider. And it requires that we recognize that we don't ultimately sustain ourselves. God does. He's our sustainer. There's a story towards the middle part of the book of Exodus. God's people have been led out of Egypt, led out of captivity and slavery. And they're in the middle of a desert and they're hungry. They have absolutely no idea how to get food for themselves So God promises to give them food. He says this, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. They get twice as much on the sixth day, so that on the seventh day, their day of Sabbath rest, they don't have to go out and get anything. God's people don't have the food they need. So God provides. God's people can't sustain themselves in the desert. So God sustains them. And the same is true for us if we'll trust God. In six days, we can produce and achieve and earn enough to cover the seventh day. Because God will provide and God will sustain. And because we can trust God to provide and to sustain, we can rest And when we rest, we learn a few things. We don't actually need everything we think we do. Our companies don't fall apart in one day. And we won't fail out of school. Are you gaining the world and yet losing your soul? Or are you teetering on the edge of considering gaining the world and being willing to risk your soul. We often look to our work to meet some of our deepest needs, our need to be significant, 
our need to be valued, our need to be recognized, to be known, to be loved, to be 